Hi everyone. Um, today I wanted to talk about working with egregores. Egregores have become a big topic in the kind of occult and paranormal community the last while, probably a couple of years. Um, and today I want to talk about not the history, not what groups do and do do it, uh, literary references, definitions, all that type of stuff. I want to talk about if you are a practitioner or just in a random slob on the internet, as I like to think of myself, how would you go about um, thinking about egregores, um, about working with them yourself, possibly trying to create your own, um, detecting the influence of those in your life, um, either ones inten intentionally created or ones that just arise kind of spontaneously, for example, in families. Um, and give you some tools for thinking about it a little bit more precisely so that then you can interrogate these ideas and experiences and impressions and uh, your own experiments on your own to come up with your own understanding of these uh, subtle structures that uh, overshadow and inform and enliven various groups of people. Um, which is how I would define an egregore. You can go online and find a bunch of different uh, of um, definitions and ideas about egregores, um, which I have done, and I ended up more confused than when I started, <laughs> um, which is understandable because it's, it's not how we're trained to think in the West. Um, however, and I, I found that when you have something, um, even people that study it uh, quite closely and in a very meticulous fashion, they're saying, well, it's it's like uh, Coke is an egregore, uh, political parties and nations are egregores, um, your family is an egregore, your local church has an egregore, your school. It, it, at a certain point, this it, it encompasses so much. Now, I think that they, they are making a decent point in that there are these uh, cell structures uh, behind and informing the physical manifestations of all these different types of groups. But if you're a practitioner, uh, you want to learn more about it, it's like a little overwhelming and it's hard to kind of get a toe in the door. So what the heck is this? How would I work with it myself? Um, how would I discover? Well, are these egregores influencing me in ways that are beneficial? Or um, are they hindering me in some way? What can I do about it? How do I personally interact with these types of subtle structures? Um, so I wanted to approach it from that angle uh, today of just trying to give you a feel for what egregores might be, what these subtle structures are to be, how you can uh, kind of um, chop it up a little bit or systematize it so you can find your own way into these types of subtle structures as they may be operating in your own life. And then um, also, if you are interested in uh, generating any of your own more consciously, even if it's just, uh, you know, you want to provide some extra protection, a little bit of uh, extra connection uh, spiritually with your family and friends, your loved ones, um, that is a great use of an egregore. And uh, you can start on that pursuit today. <laughs> You probably are already doing it to a certain extent unconsciously, but you can um, kind of boost that effort and um, and pursue things that way. So, um, to give you a little bit of information about me, I've always been very interested since, I guess, in my early 20s about um, the subtle manifestations, the subtle structures, the subtle uh, bits of information, the people and entities that you only interact with on the uh, these subtle planes, like in dream states or in altered states of consciousness, or through kind of uh, psychic, uh, subtle psychic impressions that may be sensory, but that, you know, you alone are perceiving that's not apparent to everyone else. Um, I started mostly with my near-death experience, where I was put in very obvious contact with some entities that have continued to be in contact with me. Um, on the subtle planes. This sounds so corny, but uh, when you get like very uh, precise information that can be helpful to you, uh, you start to take, over decades, you start to take it seriously. Um, and then I also, over my life, have spent, uh, done some reading about people that work this way. Uh, Dion Fortune in her books, The Sea Priestess and Moon Magic goes into this uh, very precisely and extensively with examples. Uh, about um, when you're performing ritual magic, 
with other people on the physical plane, how this supported, uh, is supported by and um, kind of plugged into these subtle structures and subtle traditions and subtle entities who are feeding back and forth between the planes to help the manifestation of whatever it is you're trying to go for. Um, she also writes a lot about these type of processes in her other books, fiction and nonfiction. Um, Robert Monroe the great out-of-body uh, traveler and voyager has done a lot of uh, work about these type of things. His, um, she writes about this extensively in all his diaries about his out-of-body experiences. He has uh, three books about his out-of-body journeys and uh, giving you information on how you can journey out of the body. Also what he does, which to me is fascinating, and I admire him for it greatly, is he is thinking, well, is this just something to explore for and be creative with, and just part of our expansion of consciousness and as ourselves, as uh, conscious spiritual entities, which I think is a noble pursuit. At the same time, he noticed that he would see people who needed help, mostly dead, people who had died and um, were stuck or freaked out and needed help. He's like, how can I help them? He pursued this and then he founded an institute, the Monroe Institute, which has a number of training programs where you can get out of the body, but he also uses audio tapes, visualizations, um, straight out spiritual transmission to let people know how they can um, get out of the body themselves and then travel to these certain areas find these uh, people and traditions that he has set up to help people who um, they find out there who need help passing on. Um, and this speaks to me, especially because this is something that I, I've um, found myself in, uh, <laughs> you know, finding out about people that you know or that you don't know who are not having an easy time of it and uh, possibly being able to help them uh, move on to uh, areas and uh, places on the on the other side um, that can help them to you know stabilize them and help them get over because a lot of people a lot of animals dying could be traumatic um, you can have a lot of unresolved issues you can not know much about consciousness and the body and how they interact um, so it could be very difficult and it's something that we can help people with this is very similar to you know comforting someone who is sick or injured. Um, so those are a couple of um, people that I think are very worthwhile. Uh, I also worked with um, or studied with um, various uh, spiritual teachers who uh, consciously worked with egregores and um, I was in a Tibetan Buddhist meditation st uh, center with a Rinpoche living there for a while. They were a little bit more uh, low-key about the ins and outs of what they were doing. However, it was very obvious uh, living there and being around these people to see um, egregores, to see transmission, and to see how uh, even individuals can influence um, large groups of people with their own uh, intention and will. Um, and then I studied, uh, sat with Leslie Temple Thurston and her group Corelight for several years. And uh, she was actually very uh, upfront, upfront and explicit about um, leveraging these type of uh, subtle structures and the interactions of groups together to um, uh, manifest uh, spiritual growth and help you maintain spiritual states and increase your effectiveness in terms of your own spiritual growth and being able to manifest that in the world as helpfulness to other uh, creatures, people, uh, plants, animals, and so forth. So now I'm going to try and throw a bunch of metaphors and analogies and stuff at you to try and get you to grok, as the saying goes, you know, get a feeling for, understand, twig to, the penny drops. What the heck is an egregore? You can tell I'm trying to be uh, on my best behavior because I didn't say what the fuck. Shit, I just did. Oh, well. So um, a lot, the classic egregore is set up by a spiritually focused group that is uh, interested in occult practices and is trying to continue on uh, as opposed to just, you know, three guys that get together and then they all lose interest in the whole thing. Goes, um, so 
for example, you would have, let, let's say, um, the Masons or uh, like Tibetan Buddhism or any type of a cult, you know, the, the Golden Dawn, all these type of organizations. Um, so what I would like to do first is compare this to an interest of mine over over 40 years, I think, has <laughs> been sewing. I like to sew my own clothes. I like to sew quilts. Mostly I, I sew my own clothes. I'm very interested in it, and I've been since I was quite young. Excuse me. So how do you learn to sew? Right? Same if you're interested. How do I become an esotericist and start working with these you know, ritual magic or es esoteric principles? You have to learn from somewhere. Now, back in the day when I was first learning, you would go to a sewing school or a sewing shop. And sewing shops were fantastic because, um, for example, there's one Stone Mountain and Daughter that's been around a ton of years on Shattuck and Berkeley. And they have all type of materials there that you would work with. They have notions. They have tools, just like the Masons. They have, um, you know, all different types of fabrics and thread and lace and zippers and buttons. They have a whole wall of buttons. If you ever get a chance to go there, it's insane. Um, so they have all these materials. They have uh, patterns. They have instructional books. Uh, back in the day, they would have uh, CDs or VCR tapes or cassette tapes that you could watch to get uh, instruction on how to uh, set a sleeve or do a uh, pad stitch for tailoring with horse hair, right? All these various techniques. They also have, many of them, classes, right? You can go there, they have the machines, you can bring your own, and you have someone, a lot, real life person, <laughs> there who will guide you and give you feedback on the process and help you with ease and, and fitting and why do, why is it pulling at the bus? You, well, anyway, <laughs> or the shoulders. Why am I always busting, you know, ripping the shoulders out of my clothing? What can we do about that? You know, help you with these problems and get you so that you can become adept. You get in this uh, big line of transmission of knowledge of sewing, and then you may get so good that you can go on and teach other people, right? Then the, the tradition continues. Um, there will be a lot of people there. You'll also have a lot of, as I was saying before, like reference books, reference materials that you can uh, look to and in this way access uh, people who went before and figured these things out before you so you're not just like swimming blind. So that would be um, the physical sewing store. That's like the physical lodge that you would go to, let's say. It's like the, the Christian science reading room, right? Your local church. You go there, uh, there are um, instruction, uh, there's uh, uh, informational material, and then you also have hands-on instruction with real life people there. Um, when the internet came in, my sewing actually improved a lot because I was not limited by having to go to a physical location. You had these incredible forums and people who uh, had YouTube channels and they could put up uh, uh, big reference tables of, okay, if you are using this particular type of fiber in this weave, then, you know, what type of thread you're going to use? What gauge needle are you going to use? What is the best stitch that you're going to use? right? So it removed a lot of um, the barriers to this type of knowledge. You don't have to go to a physical place. The person that you want to talk to who has the knowledge does not have to be there at the same time that you are, right? You can watch a video. Um, stuff that is, let's say, let's say you're, you're uh, in uh, Podunk, wherever, and you want to sew something that is uh, like Jean-Paul Gaultier or something, right? You know, with the, that type of fit and using the real slinky, uh, like silk jersey, uh, that type of thing. Angaro, Emmanuel Angaro, those beautiful um, ruched, draped, uh, very uh, form-fitting dresses that he would make with the, the placas down the front and everything. This requires some very specialized techniques as far as fitting. Uh, pattern drafting, how to work with these slinky, silky materials to stabilize them, um, all that type of stuff. If you're in uh, Podunk, wherever, there may not be anyone within many miles, hundreds of miles with that particular knowledge. But if you go online, right, then you, you can go to the people in, in Paris or people who've been to Paris and can fill you in on how these couture uh, techniques are executed 
And uh, so it is a very exciting development, but you can see how you go from the, the, the frankly physical to the more abstract in the online uh, forums and how uh, there are many advantages to having it be abstracted, right? You can uh, reach more people, uh, you can have more esoteric information that's gonna appeal to a, a much smaller percentage of people, um, but they can all be brought together and you're not so constrained by time and space. <laughs> so if you think about an egregore that you're setting up around an occult lodge, let's say, it's uh, like one level more abstract than the digital era. So uh, how these would be set up. Actually, another uh, interesting person while I'm thinking about it is uh, Josephine McCarthy. She talks a lot about these uh, subtle structures, how to set them up, how to work with them um, in groups. She has a lot of uh, free materials online as well, a uh, training program that uh, hopefully I'll remember to link below this video for you if you want to investigate that. So how this can play out a lot of the times is that um, you will end up visualizing is usually how it is discussed. So you will uh, have the people in the group who are more adept and who are setting this all up visualize a physical structure and when that is set then and other people can uh, see it and enter it. Um, you can put in there the materials, you can put in there conduits to uh, the various uh, and uh, astral or let's say uh, discarnate entities who are also involved in your occult project. Um, you can put in there, if you think about uh, going to the, the sewing shop, right? You can have the fabric there. You can interact with other people who are in there. Uh, you could watch a film strip. You could, um, let's say, have uh, various scents that are related to, you know, let's say, uh, recognizing uh, certain herbs or something. You could have all the herbs there so you could touch them and uh, uh, see what their scents are and have the information about uh, what part of the body that they may be beneficial for or if they're um, helping with very, achieving uh, various altered states of consciousness or relationship to a particular uh, deity. Um, so you could have all these experiences in there um, it doesn't just have to be like a reading room, right? Anything that you can imagine can be in there. Um, so uh, you could have, uh, uh, Robert Monroe would call them rotes, and I forget what it stands for, but it's basically like an energetic ball of information and experience that gets thrown at you, and when you catch it, later on you can unravel it how you like, and it could be a full-on sensory experience, including a sense of proprioception or movement in space. So you could have a rote that throws at people, it's like, okay, this is how you perform a certain ritual movement or a mantra uh, with gesture, that type of thing. Um, so basically it is only limited by your imagination. <laughs> The other thing that happens, um, so that would be like the astral temple, let's say, the astral lodge. Most places, and I would suggest this is best practices, you're going to want to put, just like at your home or your car, you're going to want to limit access. So you're going to want to have, for example, keys, uh, locks, uh, many lodges. It's like you'll have um, uh, uh, grades, right? So you're in for a certain amount of time, you've done a certain amount of study, and you have access to a certain part of the Astral Lodge and materials. And then when you graduate from that, you go on to the next. Now, what these keys for Astral Temples will all often be is like a particular color or a like a sigil, uh, like a logo. People talk about this with egregores and advertising logos. Um, the same, it's not the same idea. Uh, it's with these subtle structures, you are uh, putting a lock on the door. You're only allowing certain people access who can, um, who 
who you've given this particular uh, symbol and color information to, or whatever, however it is, you know, a certain word or whatever, it's like a pass, password protected system. Um, now, obviously, advertising logos are out there in the world, but it can be a, a focus for emotion and uh, to help maintain the structure of whatever, you know, I saw a Bentley today. It was a horrifying looking car, a new Bentley, um, but, you know, it had that whole logo. So that could be something that uh, if you have enough people who are like, wow, that car is super exciting and maybe seem like a super rich stud, you know, like I've made it if I have the Bentley, you know, you can see that kind of emotion glomming onto it and making it uh, increasing the charisma and desire of the Bentley brand, right? Now, of course, all these um, corporations, and stuff. They, they do a ton of stuff in the material world to assure their success as well. Um, but there is that possible aspect of it uh, happening with advertising and logos, uh, leveraging uh, unconscious emotion uh, and trying to use that to drive consumer activity. So there's that. Let me take a look at my notes here. It's going on a while, but it's kind of a big topic. Um, yeah, so basically, I would divide it up that you're going to have um, a container of some type, usually. You're going to have various uh, sensory type experiences that give access to information um, within that container. You are going to protect that container somehow. Um, and have a third point here, which I seem to have forgotten, so I'll do it. Oh, um, but then also as well, there will be the uh, kind of emotional tone, the, I want to say, energetic frequency, um, and the moral ethical thrust or principles that are informing a lodge, especially with uh, occult and esoteric groups. But also this is something that is very strong, in, for example, in families or in uh, churches or synagogues, you know, there's a smaller community uh, religious organizations. Um, if you think about getting together, if you have brothers and sisters, and you think about uh, a typical meal from when you were little and the family was having a good time and uh, you'd go out, um, we used to go out to this course, <laughs> pizza place, and we get these, uh, they had these uh, salads that had a lot of canned beans in them, like kidney beans and garbanzo beans, and it just it would drive my brother insane. But we always had a great time there. They had like a pool table and they had like some very primitive video games like Pong. And we would always have a great time running around there. But um, so you just talk, start talking about these canned beans, and my brother was, oh, but you know, he's grossed out. But it really brings back that that happy, fun, uh, free, exciting time. And you think about it, it has a, a, a sensory component. Uh, it draws you to a particular place where you were all together, and you were having fun. Um, and so it, it reinforces a certain kind of um, feeling to the family unit um, and our siblings. And, um, you know, this can go the, the other way. If, if people are coming from abusive or unhappy households, you can have uh, very strong visceral reactions to sensory uh, sensations that, that happen around times when you, like parents were fighting or, or there was a threat of violence or worse. Um, so it can work both ways, um, but this is a big part, the emotional energy of kind of feeding these subtle structures and the particular emotion and ethical moral tone of the group is going to be a, a beacon to the group members. It's going to attract uh, new members if all if it becomes strong enough and uh, people manage to pay attention. Um, you know, you'll feel drawn to a certain group. Um, and it can kind of, I don't want to say, I'm getting into this. It can serve as kind of a form of uh, protection or not. Um, 
because any type of group that uh, has something that they're pursuing that is worthy, that is worthy of pursuing, um, if you're trying to actually help create positive change in the world and, and do something uplifting, um, then you're going to not want to evangelize, but you're going to want to find your people uh, to, to bring to you to, to help in this work. Because if it's important work, then it's important to have it done, and that will take probably more than just you <laughs> or the three people that you work with at this point. So you're going to want to be precise about your uh, ethical principles, and you're going to want to uh, make that a forefront in, in the group and um, be upfront about it. And uh, this will help uh, weed people out that don't want to uh, be straightforward that way or don't have the same principles or goals. And it will help attract people that do. It's another form of like warding or protection. Uh, on the group level. If you are an individual, um, this is one of the uh, most basic and strongest forms of protections that you can have is get right, get straight <laughs> with what's important to you and um, be upfront about it. If you are against racism, if you do not believe in oppress oppression, if you are not sexist and you keep that to your little lonesome and you want to give everyone a chance and so you don't want to rock the boat and so you don't want to straightforwardly say you know to your uh, grandfather who's being racist or your next door neighbor or uh, a colleague, you know, you don't have to be super confrontational about it, but you know, it's important to put it out there. If you just keep it to yourself in your own heart, it's not doing anyone any good. And people will not, they can only judge you by your actions in public. Um, and so if you don't do anything <laughs> about it, and, you know, if you aren't in some manner in your daily life trying to enact whatever principles are important to you, then no one's going to know about it and they're just going to figure, you know, if you're hanging out with people who are racist or sexist because you have similar interests or, oh wow, they have, um, you know, delved into all this occult stuff or whatever, um, people are going to figure that you're okay with all that stuff and they're not going to want to uh, you may be attracting people that you don't want to be associated with and more importantly or as well as also important um you will not be as likely to attract uh subtle protection when you get in over your head which hopefully if you're an esotericist or interested in the occult you will get in over your head at some point because you know you got to take some risk right if you're uh, never in over your head, then you're you're probably not progressing, right? Um, if you man, if you really try your best to you know live by your principles and be straightforward and not necessarily be confrontational, but you know doing you know being compassionate towards other people and creatures, um, I've found that you're much more likely to attract a type of subtle help and protection that can pull your fat out of the fire. There are all types of rituals and spells and types of protection, all that type of stuff that you can do. Um, and I have no problem with it. It can be very helpful. I don't normally lean that way, um, but I found that, um, you know, keeping a pure heart and uh, trying to do your best by other people um, will take you as far, if not, if not far, if not farther. Um, so, uh, let's see. Now, this gets to another aspect of egregores. This is going on forever. I don't know what to tell you. Um, hopefully you're still here. That how to tell if an egregore is something that is, um, helping you or maybe not. Um, I would say again, uh, you know, look at how your life is going. 
right? Are you able to, on the whole, now of course it changes are not linear, they happen over time, you can have ups and downs, but on the whole, are you able to, um, you know, accomplish things in your life more easily, uh, get the day-to-day -day stuff done and, you know, feel a little happier, uh, less stressed? Uh, are you able to, uh, you know, not uh, argue with your spouse or your friends? Um, are you able to do things that normally would make you nervous or you'd freak out about a little more easily? Um, you know, you just check in, your, check in with yourself uh, like at the beginning and then you can check in a month later and say, how does it seem to be doing? Um, this is another instance where mindfulness meditation can be helpful for you if you use it as a tool to uh, check in with, you know, what thoughts are going through your head, um, what type of emotions are you experiencing, right? If you have a general baseline feel for how your monkey mind tends to do, the type of stupid stuff that you tend to think about, right? Then you can tell when you're having these new impulses. Now, an egregore, um, for example, when I, my involvement with uh, Corelite, Leslie Temple Thurston's organization, I, I tend to be calmer, uh, have a, a bigger picture view. It's easier for me to uh, be more organized and more compassionate with people around me. Um, so that that's helpful. That's, you know, everyone's kind of putting that emotion in and we're, we're getting it back out. So you can kind of uh, be more effective at being hopefully a compassionate and more articulate person. I don't know how articulate I'm being right now, <laughs> but who knows where I would be if I hadn't been there. <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, you can check in with yourself and if you are getting involved with like a new group or whatever, just, you know, take a baseline with yourself. You can make a little video, uh, video. uh you can write down some notes about generally how you're feeling and then, you know, set an, a, a reminder on your calendar, check in in a month and see how you're doing. Or you're starting to feel uh, kind of more petty, things are getting to you more. Sometimes this can mean that you're um, starting to have some kind of shadow stuff or unresolved issues come up. So that's another reason why mindfulness is important. Uh, therapy, if things are getting uh, more difficult for you or that you find that that's valuable. Um, and I have a um, article on what to keep in mind if you're um, getting involved in sex magic with other people, but it's very applicable to getting involved in any type of group. Um, and so you'll want to also, um, when you're getting involved in a group, you know, maintain your other interests, make sure, you know, schedule it that you're keeping up with your family and friends as you normally would so you don't become isolated. And um, then we get on to what if you realize that you're not so into this egregore or that, that this group, you're, you know, you want to pull back or sever connections with it. Um, some of the easiest ways to do this would be if you have any, let's say, I can't find anything right now, oh, but let's say you have any pamphlets, books, ritual objects. I don't know why I'm holding this. This is a copy of Jacques Vallée's Confrontations. It's just like a really stupid example, but if you have a ritual object, <laughs> pamphlet, candles, uh, vestments or clothing, anything like that, and you feel like a charge on it, or you just kind of feel like you want to, you know, set it aside, um, you can literally put it in a box, put it away, don't think about it. If you really want to uh, decharge it, um, a couple of uh, good ways to do this are you can put it out someplace um, on fresh earth or just the ground, uh, where it's going to be hit by the sun and the wind and the rain, the dreadful wind and rain. And uh, actually, that's not where we're trying to go for. We're trying to <laughs> keep these things to shut up and not talk about their bitchy, horrible, awful, murdering sister. Um, so, that's a folk song. I'm sorry. So you want to put it out where it's going to be hit by the sun and the elements and everything. And this will kind of get it to, you know, uh, decharge of any subtle... Uh, energy that's on there. Another way that you can uh, decharge things, this is a little uh, gross, but can affect it. And it, it's good, especially if you can do it real, like really just like dismissively, is uh, pee on it. Whatever it is, just pee on it. Uh, 
one caveat, uh, if you have any blood near or in your urine, don't do that. You know, wait if you're menstruating. Uh, wait if you have a kidney stone or bladder infection. First of all, I feel very sorry. I hope it gets better soon. But uh, wait. I say as long as you don't see any blood in there, go to town. Uh, you could borrow someone else's. Um, or let's say not borrow. You just use it if I don't want to return it. Um, but yeah, this is something you're just dismissive, just, you know, get it soaked and then just throw it in the trash. Um, be done with it. Now, this can help and this could be a powerful ritual. However, the more difficult part of uh, dissolving a connection with an egregore is going to be the part, um, the subtle parts of the emotions and the thoughts that come through. Um, so you may have dreams that seem like that egregore is impinging on you or you're getting kind of like impulses or thoughts that are bothering you. Um, so just don't think about it, right? I hate that advice. Uh, if we could just not think about it, it, it it's ridiculous. So what I um, advise is that you want to have displacement activities, right? It's like people that are trying to quit smoking and chew gum instead, right? So um, this is why it's always a good idea, as I said before, to keep up with outside uh, people. Um, so, you know, see your friends more, your family. Um, it's also a good idea, and this is one uh, strong reason why all, uh, practicing occultists and, and occultists and esotericists should have hobbies and interests, right? You know, uh, you, for me, I could start sewing, right? Uh, I'm very interested in growing succulents and cardisiforms, little weird plants. Um, so you could go start, uh, you know, doing some propagation or whatever, uh, flying to succulent society, go to a succulent garden, right? I'm getting excited thinking about this right now. Um, you know, pursue your interests. That's why it's always good to have a, a bunch of interests kind of in reserve. Um, if, especially if you're an occultist, because you have these times you need to cool down, you need to take your mind off things, and just sitting there trying not to think about something is not very effective. Uh, go walking, go hiking, uh, go out outdoors, uh, you know, go uh, find a historical town, you know, a few miles away, and, and go exploring or uh, finding a orchard where you can go pick your own apples or something if it's fall and you have that opportunity. You know, there's a ton of things you could do, but just do that. Uh, new sensory experiences are especially helpful um, because the material is always going to want to take precedence over the subtle. And, um, you know, anything new will help to distract you. Uh, and just keep at it. Uh, schedule it in your calendar. Um, you know, eat right. Uh, try not to... Uh, you know, get high or drunk or that type of thing a lot. It's not going to help you um, stay away from that influence. And uh, it's also possible to do various, uh, you know, straight up banishing rituals, protection rituals, and uh, you, you can find those online <laughs> or in various books. If, you're, if you got this far, you know what you could do. But having a multi, especially if it's something where you feel like you really want to to cut that, then it's good to have a multi multi pronged approach, <laughs> right? So you can develop a plan and work your plan. Okay, what else is I going to say here? Um, yeah. So I think this. The only other point that I wanted to make in this long rambling discussion that <laughs> you deserve a medal if you're still here is that, um, once again, uh, a pure heart, pure intention, um, really, you don't have to be perfect, but just, you know, making an effort, getting up every morning and just trying to, to do your best um, and to treat other people well is going to protect you, it will also act as a kind of a filter, even if you do get uh, close to or involved with a group where, um, let's say, it's like most of human activity, right? That there's some good stuff going on, there's some not good, so good stuff going on. You could um, get something out of it, 
but there's other things you're really not sure about. You really don't want to give, you know, you're, you don't want to leave that alone. If you have that type of intention and you approach um, the egregore and your spiritual practice with that type of intention, you will be able to, to draw out the good and uh, not have the uh, bad or confused or um, less nice, that's a stupid thing, stuff attached to you so much. Um, because it's very difficult to find some of what I, I, I've been uh, reading about and, and seeing, talking about agri-wars is people getting like real uh, uh, anal about the groups that you get involved with, which is understandable. There's a lot of things uh, to watch out for when you get involved with spiritual groups, and I try to try to address that. But it's going to be people, and there's going to be times when uh, people behave badly or they're not uh, up to perfection standards. It's going to be people that have uh, good hearts, but they have problems. Um, and so I think it's important if you want to be a mature person um, and live in the real world, and be effective in the real world. You have to uh, be able to deal with imperfection. You have to be able to deal with people um, who are not perfect. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Obviously, there are going to be some people that are just too much for you, that are abusive, super manipulative. Avoid them. But like regular old people, um, you know, the other thing is that to me, from my own personal spiritual orientation, I'm very driven by compassion for all sentient beings. Can you tell I have a Buddhist <laughs> background here? But, and to me, you have to be open to people who have problems if you want to be able to help anyone. If someone's perfect, they don't need your help, right? It's the people with problems, it's the people that are muddling through, it's the people like you, probably, and I definitely like me, who who need help. So if you're going to learn how to help anyone, you have to deal with people who are not paragons of perfection. And I think it's foolish and immature to expect that. You need to avoid people who are manipulative. You do not have to put up with any abuse and you should avoid it. Um, you, I would say, have a right to go and associate with people that have common interests that you enjoy, uh, that you admire, um, that you have a fun time with and, and uh, have affection for. But at the same time, you know, to expect people to be perfect, you know, it, it just is toxic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know that word gets used a lot, but it really is. Um, I, I I don't have a lot of respect for that type of viewpoint. People can get um, really judgy, and uh, it's, I, I mean, I don't understand that you need to have, have an openness. Um, it's like the whole idea of like constantly uh, banishing and having this circle of protection. It's like, how are you going to learn anything? How are you going to be a useful person if you shut out the entire rest of the world? I, as I said before, I've um, done work off and on in my life with, you know, trying to help uh, people or animals who are having a hard time crossing over. And you know, if I'm constantly shutting everything that's out that's not perfect, I'm not going to um, be aware of a being that is hurting. Um, and I don't, I don't want to be that way. So I would say that, um, you know, if you have a pure heart and a pure intention, that will attract protection to you and um, give, give you the courage <laughs> or maybe the foolishness to go out there and maybe actually help someone, which, you know, there's, I mean, what, el what else are we here for, in my opinion? Um, so, uh, if you made it this far, <laughs> bless you. <laughs> I hope that you, uh, learned something. I hope that it was helpful. Um, 
And yeah, I'm going to hopefully remember to post the links below. If I don't, if there's anything else that you would like to know about or hear about, um, yeah, uh, hit me up, leave a comment. You can send me email or whatever. And uh, thank you so much for listening. And I hope you have a great